So I'm Elena Glassman. Again, I'm here from uh, MIT CSAIL to represent work that I did with Lila Fisher, Jeremy Scott, Rob Miller, uh, and um, we, it's a system called FUBAS. Uh, we named it because Fu and Baz are these classic meaningless variable names um, that uh, we're going to give feedback on two students in their code at the scale of thousands of solutions at once. So this kind of scalable teacher feedback is hard because when you're receiving thousands of solutions in a massive open online course or MOOC, uh, you, you don't have an autograder for this. Uh, it's very context dependent. So for example, here on the right, we have two examples of for loops in Python where in one case you're iterating over i, uh, sorry, you're iterating over the indices in an input array. We're calling it i, that's fine. And yet in the second example, we're iterating actually over the elements in the array. And i is now a, a bad variable name. Sloppy variable naming can indicate sloppy thinking. Uh, and it also can be misleading to others and reveal misconceptions. It's, it even matters when you're uh, an intern at Google and readability reviews. So variable names matter. Um, power grading is not an option because when you have thousands of solutions, you have thousands of variable names. Um, we're never going to read them all. So how can we still give quickly uh, on the part of the teacher um, feedback on uh, this aspect at scale? So we present FUBAS. It allows a teacher, here this is a snapshot of the teacher to explore student chosen variable names and uh, do that in the context of the actual of the code that it occurred in, or bring context along. Uh, teachers to simply label a small subset of good and bad examples. Think of this and Hall of Shame example. So, um, uh, uh, we're going to do this actually by giving that those examples back to students as personalized quizzes. So, in the teacher interface, they're simply making quiz templates um, that are deliverable to current students and future students. So I need to define a few terms. The first is a variable role. It's defined by the sequence of values that a variable takes on during execution of, say, a test case that you might have already used in the autograder. So in the for loops that we just talked about, um, I in each case, it might be named the same thing, but it's a different uh, role in the program, and therefore um, we consider them separately. We, we consider all the variable names for each role independently. The second definition is one we previously de defined in Tokai last year, which is a stack. Right? The, the name comes from the fact that we give pieces of paper to a bunch of different uh, TAs and say, hey, cluster them, you know, so you only really need to look at one in each cluster. They literally made stacks of paper. Um, but a, a stack is defined here as a set of solutions that uh, each contains the same set of variable roles, no more than no less, and the same syntax to manipulate these variables. So more concretely, uh, we might have a couple raw student solutions that have different formatting, different variable names, maybe even slight reorderings of things that don't really affect the actual computation or the, um, the values that the variables take on over time. Uh, we're just going to represent them as a single solution, a stack solution, um, and the names are going to reflect the most common name given to that role across all the solutions in that stack. So in the teacher view, I just want to take those definitions and show you how they show up here in the teacher um, you have a stack of and indication of how many solutions are in that stack relative to the total number in the data set. In this case, we have 1,500 students, solutions in this stack out of 4,000. These are all correct. But uh, they're not all created equal because there's some truly good and bad variable names that students are using um, in their answers. So each of these sets of columns in the uh, what can actually be sometimes a very long table underneath represent the different variable roles that occur in this solution. Uh, you can see here the teacher has started annotating certain variable names as good or bad. Uh, we can see the relative prevalence of different variable names for that role. We can see the unique combination of variable names in a particular student solution. These, um, this is deduped, so these are unique sets of variable names. 
And finally, we can gray out the variable names that match the template that was given to them in the first place. So we're really trying to draw the teacher's uh, attention to that which is student generated. Why are we doing this? Well, on the student side, we can generate, um, we can take their code, execute it on the same test case, and um, you'll see that we've taken uh, one of the variable names, blanked it out, made it just A, and, um, and now students can try and guess what to, how to evaluate each of these alternatives for that placeholder. Um, when they hit submit, they get to see if they agree or disagree with the teacher and maybe any comments that the teacher left. So now I'll just demo the system real quick. Okay, so um, as you can see, actually, I, I already started labeling things a little bit. Um, this is our stack. Um, I can pick out other things. This is also, I think, too short. Um, <laughs> as I make annotations, a oh, Winnick, that's result in Polish. Um, <laughs> Uh, as I, oh, okay, result counter, not so crazy, whoops, uh, not so crazy about that one. Um, as I make annotations, I can scroll down to see other semantic, uh, sorry, other stacks which have different semantics or structure, um, but my labels are getting propagated down. New base, that is definitely, so this is, this is an iterative computation of base to the exponent. I don't like new base. Okay. Um, I'm going to scroll down to uh, this stack, which is different because it has an additional variable that the students created, an iterator variable and a for loop. And here um, I've said, yeah, you know, I is fine for this variable, E is not, because again, that reflects that fundamental misconception. Though I can see that far more people chose I than E, so that's good. People seem not to be making this mistake as much as they might. So um, with these annotations, uh, we're going to get a quiz preview pane, which shows that, OK, um, with these annotations, I can uh, add an, uh, let's see. I can uh, say, oh, running sum. It's actually a running product. Um, I can add any names that I want to. Um, and so I have two quizzes that could be sent back, two templates that could be sent back to students in, in their view. OK. So the workflow here is that you have your solutions coming in. The teacher spends maybe 10 minutes annotating something like 20 different variable names. Uh, and that might generate three to four quiz templates, depending on how they apportion their time, uh, which are viewable either by the same students or by future students. Because uh, maybe the teacher walks away. Those quiz templates are still valid. They're reusable. Um, and students in the future can get instant feedback rather than waiting for the teacher to, to generate these based on their data. So from the student side, we might submit our code. It looks somewhat different than before. Um, and here is one of the quizzes that we just made just now. So I might say, yeah, let's see. I think this is too abbreviated. Hmm, I think running sum is just fine for this. And then they're like, no, no, no. <laughs> um, that's, that's a misconception there in your code. So we evaluated both the teacher uh, side and the student side. And the teacher side, we really wanted to know what's the cost benefit ratio for all, for all this work, right? Um, we recruited 10 teaching assistants, lab assistants, and graders from Python courses. and. Uh, gave them two experiences back to back. The first was kind of trying to represent the state of the art. You've got all your student solutions, thousands of them to the same problem, in a web page you can search, seek, and find, and generate some sort of feedback to, to everyone, a single exercise where they're going to get a snippet and some names and an answer key that's hidden until they hit submit uh, of you know, whether you thought they were good or bad. Uh, we then trained them on FUBAS and had them do the same exercise using the FUBAS teacher interface. What we found was that uh, after only four to 11 minutes, each of our teachers who worked with thousands of solutions could cover 75% of our student solutions with personalized quizzes, at least one. Um, as you can see here, I've, these are stacked bar charts because some students, uh, depending on the structure of the problem, 
uh, some students would get two or even three quizzes, potentially, uh, that they would be eligible to receive because there's one quiz per variable role. Uh, not only did they have high coverage, this only took about 20 labels uh, out of the t 20 labelings of individual student variable names out of the 600 to 900 unique student variable names in each problem. On the student side, we brought in six students who had taken Python courses before. We asked them to solve as many of the problems from the previous study as possible. And, um, and then we generated the personalized quizzes for them based on the quizzes made by our subjects in the previous study. So um, the subjects in the previous study never saw th these students' solutions before, and some of them here were very different than the previous students. I guess maybe they, had, they were trained by different people. Um, the students collectively received 11 personalized quizzes. Uh, one student's solution got no quizzes because they were kind of, well, they were far enough away from the uh, mode that they had no variable roles in common. Um, but they all, well, there was a high uh, agreement with the statement that the quizzes were relevant to them, and they even started to realize that these quizzes that they were getting were not necessarily from the same author, because the, auth the quiz is expressing the preferences of the teacher, and the teachers in our original study were not required to agree with each other. So uh, I'll conclude by saying that teachers giving feedback from the actual teacher to thousands of students it remains a hard problem. FUBAS is able to do this for variable names, which are an important aspect of programming. Um, and it works not only for thousands of current students, but for future students. Uh, it takes a matter of minutes, and it has the additional benefit that students can learn from examples uh, created from their fellow students of both good and bad naming choices. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, Lydia Chilton from the University of Washington. Great talk. I love this. I totally see how this scales up to thousands of use, uh, students and having one teacher really be able to multiply their efforts. Um, my question is about how to scale the size of the code snippet. I can imagine with large code there becomes dependencies between names, like a triple layered for loop would have I, J, K, and you really want them in that order. Um, so have you explored that at all? Yeah, well, that's one reason why um, we have this table where each row, it, you, the, the rows are, are interlinked. It's, it's a set of variable names. Because you're right, um, in isolation, a variable name can be terrible, but collectively, in the context, it's fine. Um, so we're still working with introductory Python level programs, and we haven't run into kind of this larger scale issues. But for now, um, the, the interlinked columns in the table address this. Okay, so you're sort of saying that because you give enough context and your solution, your whole method is based on collecting the right context. You you're always stack. looking at the con you're always looking at a stack which captures the context, right. and you're looking at you can look at the, the variable names across the row and understand that they work well together, even if they don't work individually. Thanks. Great. Any other questions? Hello. Um, what other uses do you think you have the data? So you have one student view, which is a mini quiz after they submit. Can you imagine other uses for that, those teacher annotated data for students beyond just a mini quiz? Uh, sorry, can I, um, so other, other types of things to quiz on or other types of feedback? Or just, yeah, other types of feedback in general. I mean, it's pretty open-ended. But yeah, I you know, like, you got all this great data from an expert. You know, how else do you help students, perhaps? Sure. Um, well, Okay, there's, there's two, I asked that because there's two directions in which we can generalize. We could think about, say, comments or uh, variable, say, function names in one direction in terms of technical sophistication of the code itself um, and generate quizzes about that. We can also say, so if we weren't, the, the, the fundamental advantage of the quiz is that I only need to uh, label a few things and, I, and students can learn from examples. Um, let's see, the direct feedback, that power grading approach, I don't think is going to, be the right way to go in the future. It certainly wasn't what we chose here. So um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a quiz, right? It's just uh, any sort of way to get people to actively engage with, with alternatives, with it, whether it's the design of a function and the alternatives between that or the, the name, the structure. Uh,
You want kids to engage and themselves before they get feedback from the teacher of what they think is right. Well, we get the next question. Can uh, we have the next speaker set up? Hi, Ken from Harvard. Really nice work, Elena. Um, I was also just curious about what, what other ways uh, students might engage. Um, and one thing that came to mind was um, sort of this activity of providing feedback on uh, other students' um, responses. Is there anything that uh, would be valuable to other students by being able to see the diversity of how uh, their peers had solved the same problem or assigned their variable names. Absolutely, absolutely. The teacher view um, is fun for the teacher, but uh, and the, the quiz is one way to give students some idea about that diversity, but a little bit more filtered by an expert. Um, you could imagine, um, let's see. <laughs> I'm going to hold on to this. Um, you, you could imagine continuing to, um, uh, as long as you filter this teacher view so that uh, a non-expert can understand it, then I think they would benefit from that diversity. Thanks.